Hello, welcome to my show. My name is Brett. I'm here every week on YouTube Live on Thursdays. So if you're seeing this for the first time and you've never been here before, come check back often every Thursday. And I will be here sometimes with guests, sometimes with just you, my friends on the internet. And we take questions and answers on DevOps, containers, Kubernetes, Docker, all the cloud native stuff. So you probably have been here before and you've heard that spiel. So I'm just going to run through some of the announcements real quick before we bring on our guest this week. Uh, if you have not heard of my Patreon, this is where this show is member supported. So there's no ads. I don't take sponsors. Uh, this, this is member supported kind of deal where you can actually not have to pay anything. You can just come in and click follow on the Patreon link that's down below. And you will get updates once a week, maybe, on everything new I'm creating, guests I'm going to have on the show, all that sort of stuff. And uh, we've got we've got a about a dozen of you in the last week. So thank you all for the, if you're watching now and you're a new patron, thank you so much for signing up. You can also pay a little uh, coffee money every month to get some extra benefits, including with the High Fivers group, we do a monthly basically a coffee chat where we all get together uh, around this same time, one day of the week, every month. And that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So if you want to be a part of that, we just talk DevOps, what projects we're currently working on. It might be, it might be five people. It might be 10. It just kind of depends on the month and what people are doing. So if check that out, if you're interested as well, just today, we worked extra hard to get last week's podcast. Uh, I'm sorry, last week's live show into the podcast. So I'm going to put this in the chat. So if you are not aware, we started back up on the podcast episodes. We're going boot through our backlog. And last week's show was all about the big changes in Docker desktop licensing. So we edited that down to the, the key information. And that is now live on our podcast. And you can get that on any player, just about every player I know of on the internet. If you have a podcast player that you don't see my show on, let me know, because I try to have it available on all of them. All right. And that's enough for that news. So on the show today, I'm very excited to talk about Teleport with us. We have Ben Arendt, and he's all the way from the West Coast, West Coast of the U.S. I'm on the East Coast. So we were catching up before the show and talking about uh, Oakland and all the cool stuff that I used to that used to be my stomping ground. So welcome from Oakland, Ben. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, you can tell I have the... Um... <laughs> Sorry, I distracted you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I have the you know East Bay accent, um, originally from the UK, <laughs> but been here um, a decade. Yeah. And um, I'm a DevOps engineer at Teleport, and I've worked in a range of developer tools probably for a decade now. I was just talking to Brad about all of my adventures in various um, companies that you may know. I worked at Redis to Go, Airbrake, Exceptional. I worked at Rackspace. Um, OpenStack, all sort of fun projects that have come and gone. So the one thing that's always been standard is you always need to get some kind of access. Yeah, that is universal. So that's going to be our focus today. If you're all are, are just tuning in, um, we're going to be focusing on uh, specifically cloud native modern remote access. So we're going to go through some of like the problems of the past and the ways we did it before. And I've been, I have personally heard about well, previously the Gravity Project and then Teleport when you all announced was it last year you announced the change. Um, I feel yeah. like that was last year. Yeah. And, um, I think it was end of 2019. But okay. It, you know, last year was a blur. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I think last year was the year that I was actually becoming more aware of the projects and what you all were working on and stuff over there. So if you, so if all of you out there, you may have heard of gravity, um, which was a project by teleport. I might be getting this wrong, but now oh, we all know you as teleport. Yeah. yeah. Gravitational. Right. Yeah, and so, so now I everything's teleport. About, um, Gravity and sort of the founding of the company and actually worked with um, Ev, Sasha, uh, Sasha and Taylor at Rackspace when they were working at Mailgun. And I think they saw the similar problem of uh, trying to run compute anywhere. Um, and Gravity was this idea of sort of packaging up your um, applications and being able to run them with sort of, we would call almost like zero DevOps. And Teleport was a method for accessing those clusters. And under the hood, Gravity would package, it was a, we'd say like Kubernetes runs your applications and Gravity runs Kubernetes. And so that let people run um, and package um, Kubernetes clusters into a whole bunch of different places. So you could run um, Kubernetes on premise, but without having to get external resources. 
or we had other people who SaaS providers might want to sell their SaaS product in someone else's data center. And by using Gravity, they could package everything up if they wouldn't need to have external resources and run it in their DC. And one of the benefits of Teleport, which we pulled from Gravity was Teleport let you access and maintain and do a whole bunch of other um, controls over those um, systems. And right, so we so started kinda, off with- It sounds like it was you were solving it, you were scratching your own itch, it sounds like you were solving your own problem there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it started off with uh, like Kubernetes and server access. And over the last couple of years, we've added um, application and database access as well. Very nice. So um, let's back up for a second because uh, you were we were talking about what to talk about on the show, and it was an interesting idea to talk about like the origin of remote access, SSH, and all the things, and and sort of where that starts to struggle in our modern multi plat multi platform multi cloud world. Yeah, I mean it depends how far back in the history of access, and I think that's <laughs> the um, often you know like. 2021, people will say, oh, you don't need to access machines. It's sort of cattle-free pets, immutable infrastructure. If you access a node, I actually had a, I always work for the DevOps lead. And if you accessed it, they would terminate the instance after five minutes. It was seen as like a toxic <laughs> right. node. Who knows what you did, right? Who knows what you did? It's, yeah, um, remove it and, you know, fire something else in there. But the reality of modern DevOps is that you always need, someone needs to get access to the infrastructure for a range of things. So even if you have a fully like immutable infrastructure, you may need a team to pull logs of a system prior to rotating it, which could be even like your security team. And then what becomes interesting when you go into the world of Kubernetes, you have everything is talking to like a REST API and how do you get like a, a full audit log of who's doing what um, and having like a audit log of history about um, which commands are being run. Right. So go ahead. Sorry, you were going And I think in another, like, if you think about cloud providers in general, like someone still has access to your machines. And so there could be like the serial, I think Amazon even added a serial bus recently. So yep. you have like serial bus, you have like SSH, you have these like all methods in which you do need to get some sort of access to machines. And we see a plethora of people from all sorts of interesting use cases. So we have like some people deploying Raspberry Pis into farmers' fields, and they need to get like some kind of remote access, but there's no sort of a central command plane. And um, you can run Teleport in this mode that Teleport can dial back and deal with uh, NAT traversal, and you don't have to necessarily worry about your networking as well. And so you can think of Teleport as sort of this unified access plane that you don't have to worry about sort of protocols or um, even like the network and everything is done specific to that protocol. So for our server support, we just use open SSH certificates under the hood. And then we just have a whole bunch of stuff that makes that much easier for you to use. Yeah. And I noticed there's, um, so I go to the website, right. And there's a, a list of products and are they all related? Because they all just seem to be like access focused, right? Yeah, I guess they're all related, but they're also very deep in the protocol. And so if like, if we start with server access, um, I think this is probably what people are most familiar with. So when you uh, have a cloud provider, you'll often provide your public private key. And so you use like, um, you generate a private key on your host, you upload your public key, and that's sort of how you authenticate. That kind of works well for your smaller projects, but as you, if you're working on a team, let's say you're five people, do you have to upload every five uh, public keys to the server? And then do you have a script that runs it when they leave? And it's so very quickly doesn't become a sustainable way of sort of adding new people to get access. Right. And there's also the lack of visibility once people sort of leave. And open uh, SSH has had certificate support for a while. And this lets you, instead of providing a sort of long-lived public-private key, you can use a short-lived like X509 certificate for access. And that's what sort of all of these sort of different platforms use. So 
short lived access for us. So you can also use the same thing for our cube configs. Instead of having long lived cube configs, you only get a cube config for like a 10 hour period. And then if you right. want to access, um, use cube cuddle again, you need to get a new cube config based upon how you've set it up. Yeah, I, I think a couple of years ago, I was reading a couple, at least one great article about, uh, you know, SSH using certificates rather than keys and the benefits of all that. Um, and to me, it always seemed like the challenge was implementation and maintenance of that, right? Like there's a lot of... Yeah, because you have to manage a uh, certificate authority and then you have to worry about rotating of certificates. And that is all sort of abstracted away and Teleport makes that very easy for you. Right. Yeah, and there's never really been... Um, like, I think every project I work on, uh, the way we get into things, you know, because especially if you're DevOps or you're especially ops, uh, you you... When things go awry, you got to get on servers usually, right? At some point, you got to get on those servers. So the the methodology for how you get there and how you do it securely and it it's I find that it's related to the maturity of the team, like that the the way that you access it and making sure that you know keys are taken off and that people that are, have left have had all their keys removed. Like that's is not stuff that a young team has, right? Like a young team is like you're saying, like throwing SS key, SSH keys of their own on servers randomly when they need them. Um, you know, they might have a, a, a cloud init script that automatically installs them at startup time and it, there's a list um, or maybe there's one key and then it, and then it's given to all the people like that, that need it. And then the problem is, how do you replace that key and how do you know who accessed it and all that stuff? And there's just um, it's not a, I feel like it's not a solved universal problem. And it, it's glad to see more ideas in this space because we do. It's funny. You don't see a lot of this discussed at conferences. You go to cloud native stuff and like you said the very beginning. Everyone, we, we talk about this utopia world where everything's, you know, we never need SSH. We never need remote access to a physical machine and everything's wonderful. And you just, if it, there's a problem, you just turn it off and replace it. And then that magically fixes it. And you, and that's just really um, not true. <laughs> not true in any scale, at any scale that I'm aware of, uh, unless you're just, unless you're Netflix or Google, right? Which you probably then have tooling to automatically pull off snapshots so that you can debug after the fact, like, that's a yeah. really advanced workflow that's beyond the scope of what we're talking to, trying to talk about today. But um, that's kind of what I end up seeing out there. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you're seeing the same thing. And it sounds like these problems are trying to, or these, uh, these solutions are trying to adjust, address those problems because, um, uh, and some of this is open source, right? Like, um, yeah, the majority, so we're sort of an open core company, which means you know, 80, probably like 90% of our code is in our open source repo. Um, and you get everything, that you'd really need for even like a small team. Um, you get all of the access to the different platforms. The only thing that sort of we gate on would be more enterprise um, single sign-on providers, but we provide GitHub. You can use local auth. Um, we recently added um, role-based access control into our open source edition, which was sort of a highly requested feature. But everything else works. Kubernetes access works, databases. Um, and then there's another new feature for Teams, which we call access requests. And access requests let you um, request access from other teammates. And probably if you're running in a small team, it's probably less of a concern. You can like have wider access. But for people who want to sort of really gate and have extra compliance, it, that's sort of one of the features that we provide. Interesting. So that's almost like a a PR review on my server access <laughs> at, the, yeah. at the moment I and need what's it. Cool is you, can also, um, you can also set it kind of similar to your point in the Navy. Like I actually did a webinar on like the nuclear launch codes. So you can set like multiple people. So you have like three people must approve this before you can launch access right. in. Um, also and means then we have other cool they features. know you did it. <laughs> Cause not everybody yes. looks at logs, right? Like we, we, we might log everything, but if you, as, you know, if I, there's something about the analogy of the, if the tree falls in the woods and no one's around, does it really, you know, whatever, like there, if, if a server, if a guy, if someone uh, SSH is into a server and it's logged, but no one's reading the logs, did it really happen? Like, does, does it, does anyone know? Does it matter? Cause now you have that one off server that's slightly changed, um, but no one else, but you. Yeah, that's another benefit of Teleport. It provides the centralized logging without having to use audit D or some other kind of configuration, which can be uh, tricky. Yeah. Or you just forget about it and then something happens. You're like, oh, where are our logs? And like, oh, the host is gone. We can't get these logs anymore. Right. So um, 
I know you brought some demos. I think there's some people out there in chat. Uh, by the way, if you're watching live, uh, the reason we have guests on the show is so that the audience can participate. So if you have any questions about remote access, but as we get into the demos, like uh, throw, throw out your questions because this is the time to get them answered. Um, so this is covering Kubernetes, databases. I think we're just going to cover applications. I could show you a bit of data. I feel like I have some databases, but the demo gods may not be kind to me. Sorry. No, I, I meant teleport as a whole. Like it's, it's. Oh, as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. Databases. Uh, so for databases, we have MySQL and Postgres. We support Kubernetes. So you can think of this as getting your sort of short lived kube configs. Mm -hmm. We have applications. So sort of securing internal web apps and then servers. Okay. Um, Which yeah. server can be anything from a Raspberry Pi to a right a, thi a thing that's running a kernel <laughs> yes. that you can connect to in some way. Yeah. Um, well, what do you want to what do you want to show off first? I can just show you the Kubernetes access. Okay, that's probably right up the alley of uh, a lot of people here. Sly's got a question on can it be self hosted? Yes. Yeah, actually, only recently did we have a cloud version. For a long time, we were um, self-hosted. And our open source edition is also self-hosted. Right. So can you see my screen? There we go. Yeah. All right. So before I actually, let me uh, sign out. This is, um, I have Teleport running on the public internet, and we generally assume in the world of the sort of access tools, you have the idea of uh, bastion hosts and jump hosts. Yep. One is inside of your um, network security, and one is sort of one is inside, one is outside. I think uh, jump host is outside, bastion's inside. Anyway, I forget. That sounds good. But we assume yes. that the proxy... <laughs> I never actually made that distinction, but okay, yes. <laughs> the proxy is fine to be on the public internet. And there's also methods in which you can run teleport in a sort of very secure way in which the proxy service runs separately from the auth service. Um, and, you know, we go very deep in our, we take our security sort of very seriously. And so your teammates sort of welcome with us, sort of sign in. And you can sign in with like a local user. And we always enforce a strong second factor. Or our preferred method is this user identity provider that you already have. I have um, a GitHub group. And so here I have um, the Teleport web UI. And I have a range of um, Kubernetes clusters that I have connected. And so before I dive too deep, you know, I guess this is like pretty simple demo. It's sort of um, all of these clusters are dialing back to Teleport. This is running in a separate um, AWS account, and then I'm here using kubectl. For our Kubernetes access, there is a way in which you can use Teleport Web UI, but majority of people are just used to using the terminal. So I can show you the same experience of logging in. So I have this uh, PSH login. I'm using the GitHub auth. And it goes through this bit of a funky redirect flow, but um, I'm now logged in. And you can see I'm logged in as my sort of GitHub username, and I have access to a few different roles. Uh, OK, so. And then if I come in here, you can see these arrange my servers. So if we go to like just the server example, What's cool is I can do TSH SSH root at uh, this machine. And then I'm on um, this host. So that's sort of like the workflow, which makes it very easy for, um, you know, if you just have an inventory of machines, it can be easier than using like the AWS console, the other right. cloud provider, sort of quickly logging in. And you can do other cool stuff. So you, you can even do, I think this is the right, log in with labels. And so because I have multiple labels, it's just picking one of the hosts. Okay. And so you can like really abstract away, you know, going from the cattle, the pets, 
to the castle right. sort of mentality. to a special yeah because yeah even when i work with teams that have you know they might have kubernetes in it there might be a jump host but it's usually just one jump host and we all have to know you know the name or the ip <laughs> to get through um and it, you know uh, utility machines like that often don't get a lot of the love right because it's usually the production oh, yeah. infrastructure for the customer the internal customer the whatever the developer customer that you're dealing with it's usually that that gets all the attention and it's usually this this uh, other uh, ancillary infrastructure that tends to s suffer from a lack of automation and uh, stuff. So this it's good to see that concepts like that, uh, where it doesn't really matter what machine I'm getting into, I just need to get into a machine. Yeah, you can also put in your AWS tags as well. So if you know, it's pretty common to have like heavily tagged machines, and you right. can just use that same sort of tag flow in Teleport. Um, so, so that's so a cool. And that's all. And so right now, when you're running these commands, you're running it against basically a teleport instance, right? That you've got running on a machine somewhere. Yes. That's when I logged in. So it's this instance here on uh, right. the internet. And then this cluster. Um, we do support multiple clusters as well. I don't think I... Let me try and think what the... Oh, it's clusters. No less. Oh, I only have one cluster here. But you can also, depending upon how you configure, you can configure like multiple trusted clusters. And this is another powerful feature that we have. Um, even like some customers who are like MSPs, which is a sort of service provider. Yeah. And if they want to get access to someone else's infrastructure, they can just share their trusted cluster for a short period of time and then cut off that access. And it deals with that sort of jumping between hosts sort of seamlessly. So inside, so I have I have teleport clusters, but is the is the teleport cluster the thing? Okay, so first question is if we're talking about Kubernetes, um, which we actually haven't gotten to yet, but we've got some questions coming in, so I'm kind of prefacing this. Uh, teleport, I guess, needs to be in each cluster of Kubernetes, but is this so when I say when I see THS clusters is that teleport clusters or kubernetes clusters or are they the same thing? this they could be the same thing um depending upon how you've deployed it in my case i've just deployed my sort of root teleport cluster mm -hmm. on a dedicated um, aws host but i could have also just deployed teleport just in a kubernetes cluster and that would mm -hmm. be the same thing right and you, I'm sure you could, can you run it all the same way like you can run it in docker you can run it natively on the host you can run it in kubernetes you can just kind of yeah. Run it how you prefer. Yeah, you can run it all of the options, yeah. Right. So this clusters list is really a list of teleport installations or systems that, yeah. Correct. Actually, I think I have another good example. Uh, uh, Okay, so this one is our cloud hosted offering. So it's like teleport.sh. Oh, and this has an AWS. Actually, this doesn't have an AWS demo. I was going to show you another one. I have a teleport cluster running in my cupboard here. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, teleport home.local. And so this is just on my home. Oh, let me zoom in a bit. It's just on my home local network. Mm -hmm. and so Tele like teleport doesn't need to even be running on the internet per se. And I have like a bunch of Raspberry Pis at home that I can like get access to. But with trusted clusters, I can also connect my home Raspberry Pi to an EC2 machine if I want to like access my sort of home cluster when I'm away. Okay. So is there, what do you call it like an agent that runs in the locations that you want to get access to? What's that? Yeah, I guess you could call it an agent. Um, you, so teleport runs in these different modes. So you can mm -hmm. run it as, um, the node service, which would be in our case, any of these are running in the node service. So actually if I connect to this one, okay. Uh, oh, that's interesting. So you can do it. You can do it in browser. Yeah, you can also do it in a browser too. Yeah, inside the in the web UI. And um, what's actually super cool about the web, actually you can do this both the CLI and the web UI, is that I can share this with you, I think. 
and you can join this session. Give me, give it, give it a shot. You want to throw it in the interview uh, chat? Let's try it. I know where is the interview chat. Let me find it. Oh, uh, oh, I found it. So the key is in the URL, basically. Sounds so like. I've added you to my GitHub org. So I think you will log into my GitHub org, and then you should be able to come join me um, in this session. Oh, okay. So let me let me switch real quick to my my screen. So um, all right, so I click that URL. It's asking me. Sure. Just to my... <laughs> yeah. Give it access to all the things. Um, all right, and then. So you you can like type. Well, let's say I, uh, I'm here. So you're not typing. Right. I'm not doing anything. But you so, could, we can like bear on this now. Yeah, very nice. And so that's one of the um, like super powerful sort of like features that we get um, in Teleport. And actually, yeah. I'm going to show you how you can do use this sort of pairing for using um, Cube Cuddle on one of these hosts. So when you're when you when you say the node, uh, when you're specifically talking about the node, that's is that going to be like an SSH? essentially a TTY every time, whereas like yeah, a Kubernetes so, method would be getting me cube control. Yeah. OK. Starting to figure it out. <laughs> so actually, we were talking about um, the different modes you can run it. So I have the teleport running. This is my join token, which is only used for the initial invite, the OR server. And then I have the SSH service, which has been enabled. And then I have a few other things I've enabled here. So if you saw at the beginning, this is native um, PAM, which is sort of a standard stack that you call when you sort of log into hosts. And actually, I think this created, uh, I think I actually changed the PAM service. And then I have this other commands that we run. So I could pull in the IP address using the metadata API. Right. And this is kind of what I use to get the tags. All right. So I mean, that was a side uh, a sidebar. And then I can show you, you keep active sessions. And then actually, we can come in here and you can see this session you joined. It was like a right. 20 minute session. That's what well. does play do? Is that replay it? Session yes. recording. Oh, that's interesting. So oh, what's man, cool that about would be... this is. <laughs> it would be so. For me, all I can think about is how how I would mess up the command five times, and someone's having to watch me painfully struggle through commands, and how I can't I can't get them correct. Uh, yeah, me spelling exit wrong. It's always right. saved, right? Forever. Everything I type is forever in a log. Okay, great. So um, you have this play, and then everything's in sort of an audit log as well. Um, and then we have like a more advanced audit log that which captures events, but I can. Dive into that later. Right. Um, let me see if I have any questions that are that relate to this so far. Uh, we have a question. Uh, Felipe is asking about uh, multiple K eights clusters. I'm, I'm imagining we're going to get to that. Um, yeah, talking about K eights. How is this different or better than the zero trust network access concept, also named the VPN killer feature that is available? more and more on firewalls. Yeah, so you can think of it, I guess the world of like zero trust is definitely an abused term. Um, it can mean lots of different things. And I think teleport is sort of part of a zero trust policy to deploy. So we do have some customers who will deploy a VPN and use teleport. So there's kind of still uses of uh, VPNs, but it's not required. And how we're sort of different is we're sort of very deep on the protocol and then also sort of deep on the um, individual action and identity, which can be sort of different from some zero trust solutions. Okay. I think the answer is always kind of complex. I mean, if you talk to like a person in a uh, conference booth, depending upon what they're selling, they'll like sell whatever they need. But often you need like multiple sort of solutions to kind of obtain these sort of zero trust and, solutions. 
and uh, for myself as well as those that maybe don't know, that, like in this context, what are we assuming? What, what are we what do we consider zero trust in this context? So we okay. So I think you like step back a bit. Mm -hmm. I think in the old days, I would have given you like access to the VPN, and then you could have access to everything. And so how things have sort of evolved is when you logged in, you had to authenticate through GitHub to prove that you were your own identity. And then Teleport also enforces these short-lived certificates and everything's sort of audited. And it also goes like deep on the protocol. And so, it's to a specific uh, resource, right? Instead of, you know, most VPNs that I use, that it's it's a you have access to everything, like or everything that the VPN has access to, you carp launch, right? It's all it's a universal policy. It's a very broad set of systems and resources, and you may only need one server. So um, yeah. I don't know if that's in the scope of uh, zero trust ideas, but um, that's something that's always been attractive to me is how, where you know, giving people basically in that moment, just the thing they need and not over provision, which is what like VPN is classically known for over provisioning complete access, which is where a lot of the, you know, it's the whole, uh, we have one guard at the gate and once you get past the gate, there's no more security. <laughs> so you have, you have access to all the ports and all the servers and all the, all the networks, as long as you get through the VPN connection. Um, so that, yeah, this this seems much more granular and flexible. So yeah, and I mean, this is not a great example since these are two wildcard stars, but it does let you uh, use the labeling that we already saw, and then you can create roles to provide sort of fine grained access for um, you know whether it's um, labels on Kubernetes clusters or also groups. Another poor, bad example is System Masters is a not a great example of sort of zero trust in Kubernetes because you give access to everything. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of up to you to sort of assign your Kubernetes groups and then sort of give them to um, your teammates appropriately. So yeah, so I, I, you got a Mac there. So on a Mac, if I need to SSH with a server, is there is there something running in the background as a service that's like relaying my SSH or how does that connection actually yeah, happen? Yes, so I have this uh, like TSH, mm -hmm. that's more, um, binary that you download and install, which sort of does everything behind the, so if I actually uh, can see under the hood, one of the things that does is just like populates these clusters. And so you can see here, these like the X509 certificates for uh, this cluster. So, mm -hmm. so this is my ones for SSH. What is slightly different for um, cube configs, we actually populate your um, cube configs locally. But under the hood, kind of going back to like our open SSH public private keys for certificates. Under the hood, it's just open SSH certificates, but in a much easier way than having to sort of manage and orchestrate it yourself. Okay. So in this case, there has to be a machine on the internet that is running SSH for me to get to? Like teleport's yeah. not providing a, a separate port tunnel into some place that has an SSH demon running somewhere but is that... i think so yeah i'm correct so you could just run teleport like once you run teleport in a certain depending upon the mode in which you run it yeah you don't necessarily get access to ssh into that node okay you then need to like add nodes running the ssh service to connect back to your sort of root cluster and you actually have two options you can sort of connect over the sort of like local network if you're, you say you could you know, configure teleport in a VPC, or you could just, in my case, I just have teleport on the public internet and I'm sort of tunneling through, but you actually don't even need to do that. You can sort of change your sort of network setup depending upon sort of the risks in your organization. Sly has a question, uh, kind of similar. I was like, can you explain better how it works? Do you have a server running and an agent in every machine? Um, did that network diagram do a basic description of? of some of the sort of the pieces there's probably a better one that one was actually maybe how it works might be a good one so we have this teleport basic concepts um which is this is probably a perfect one so we have the users which go through the proxy which is teleport.ashru.earth and we have our auth server in our case we have registering 
Um, so if I need to access it, I go through the proxy and this proxy dials back. So in this SSH node, we're running a teleport service in node mode. So kind of an agent. Okay. And that's and the then four different Kubernetes, that's the four different ways or the four different types of resources I can access through the proxy. Yeah. Okay. And then for Kubernetes, I've deployed a Helm chart, which is the same sort of thing, but it runs a um, teleport in sort of a Kubernetes mode. Right. Runs it, run, I'm assuming it runs a pod with a, a similar executable that you ran on uh, native SSH on the, on the host there. Yeah. Yeah. And the same for web apps. So I actually have another cool example in which I'm running Grafana and teleport locally in Docker to provide like local access to a sort of web app that I'm running. And is that an agent on the web server that's it can be, yeah. It can be on the web server host itself. So a very popular example of this would be like if you have a Grafana dashboard, or I guess you can do this as a Kubernetes dashboard, people will make it publicly exposed. And so you could give a loopback address that only the teleport agent on that host can access it. And then it deals the it creates the reverse tunnel back to teleport to make sure that there's no sort of no rogue remote access to it. So this prevents you from needing to put those apps on the public. Yeah. At least the, the HTTP part of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, uh, Alexandra has a question. What encryption is used between the inside node or agent and the outside machine? Is there any mechanism for posture check? Yeah, so we have a few things based upon how you run it. You can... We have a CA pin, which is a hash of teleport certificate authority, which you can use to verify that the auth server is the right auth server. If you're using this edge mode, we just do it through the mutual TLS um, certificate. There's some encoding on making sure that you're joining the correct host. All right. Um, and when it comes to, okay, so we've talked about specifically SSHing in. Uh, I think this audience is definitely interested in cube control, uh, yeah. short-lived cube control. That's a pretty interesting uh, scenario that we definitely don't get out of the box with uh, Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, definitely. So here I have, I freighted three um, Kubernetes clusters in three different clouds, um, an Azure EKS and a GCP autopilot, which was a new flavor that I hadn't tried yet, but it worked. Um, cool. And so what you do is like, I start my day, I need to get access to a cluster. So I, um, you do a cube login. And so you, this logs you into the cluster. I don't know if this is right. Maybe I need to cat it. Yeah, it's not, it's in the, uh, cube directory. Uh, okay. Cube. A lot of. Yeah. Let's see. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot here. Uh, okay, uh, well, you, if was... you cat, you can cat the cube slash config. I think it's config. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh... No, I just can try just config. I could be wrong. Dot cube though. There we are. Dot cube. So what you can see here, what this has done has added. Okay, here we are. So we have this large certificate authority. Right. This is my EKS. Obviously, we like firing up different ones. This is another one using EKS cuddle. But this one here is the root, I think, for my cluster. And then let's go to our demo. I forgot the one. That, oh, here we are. Current context is Astro. So what we do is this is my cluster, and then we sort of append it. So you can also like log into multiple ones at one time, just changing your current context. Right. So, so it's reference. right. So basically that TSH command is is controlling my cube config, right? Like it's adding, updating certificates or... yeah. Okay. So uh, basic cluster two. 
basic cluster two. So for me, as a as an admin, as a Kubernetes person, I just have to make sure teleports on my machine, te teleport command line is on my machine, kube controls on my machine, the command line tool, and then when I run those TSH logins, it's that's all I have to do, right? Like I just I run the login, and now my kube control is able to talk to that server. Yeah. So if I do um, kube cuddle config from context, yeah. it's set so I can do. Um, Oh, um, spaces. So the first actual connection does take a little bit of time to do the initial handshake. But now we're sort of like connected to a I minute. Mean, this is just an empty cluster that I've been running for a week or so. And on is the is my cube control actually talking is my cube control command line actually talking to the proxy server directly? Is that how the connection is yeah. happening? Okay. So it goes through teleport. So if I uh, come in here, you can see that I had this. Um, I've made a request to the Kubernetes cluster, which one? And so you have this like full audit log of um, sort of which users I've been logged in as, and sort of everything is sort of captured. All right. And so in that case, when you did the login, if, if you, you were like earlier, you were talking about, uh, this new thing of requiring, you know, having others approve your law, lo your all login, is that where all that process would take place is during the login phase? Or it, it would take place prior to it. So you'd ask for access to the cluster. Uh huh. Oh, or oh, maybe an elevated role. And okay. And then that certificate based on your policies, I'm assuming that you configure on the teleport server, uh, the, the login certificates are time bombed based on the policy. Like, cause I didn't, I yeah, didn't so, see you ask for amount of time or anything like that in the command line. So no. So by default, I have a 30 hour session. Oh, okay. Um, and then I've also, this is quite a large generous role, but I have access to like all clusters, right? All clusters, all and groups. so it is for demos. <laughs> we always get God, uh, God access in demos. Um, yeah, very cool. And so, and I actually don't know. I so if I log into Azure, um, the same. It's switched, and then right. uh, I think it's going to be the same because they're like namespaces. Okay, there's a few other services running in Azure that's different than GCP. And so now I'm like logged into both, and um, you just need to change your current context if you want to switch between clusters. And then you can see that the sort of activity is kind of does this, between which one. Does this take care of um, RBAC management of a Kubernetes cluster for me? Or do I need to already have all those set up and then apply these policies here? Like, how does that work? Yeah, you'd have to set it up on um, your cluster of choice based upon how you want to like define the roles. Mm -hmm. So we have some people I know who they create users in Kubernetes based upon their user, but we have some more advanced, um, these like internal DB users, but you can also like pull in external identity provider options. So if you have like an SSO provider, which for your Kubernetes cluster, you can sort of map that same thing into teleport as well. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if I could have roles in Kubernetes and then specifically have users and teleport and alleviate needing specific users because the lot like because teleport's logging all the things right so it's it's showing the connection it's showing who did it so now i'm maybe not so much looking at my cube logs and i'm now paying more attention to teleport logs if that's the only way you can get into my kubernetes Cluster, server yeah. yeah yeah so in that case i mean it depends upon 
the risks in your team and how you want to uh, provide access. Um, maybe you have like system masters for the ops team, but you have like a dev role, which is like fine grained, but all developers share the Kubernetes dev group. Um, and then you create sort of custom users based and then use teleport to give them access. Yeah. Um, all right. So I see that there's potential for your, for a lot of configuration in the teleport itself in um in the proxy or server or whatever we're, we're calling it i keep forgetting the names um yeah is that is is that git can i put that stuff in git and not have it stored on the server like can i control teleport through git ops or some sort of yeah. uh we have this tool uh t cuddle um so uh let me oh i don't want to to show you that one actually <laughs> <laughs> i probably would move this afterwards anyway oh no it doesn't show my secret that's fine so you can like um it's very inspired by kubernetes so you can like get resources and um set them as well i'm trying to think of the the resource for the yaml but there is um back i forget the resource for the rbac connectors but you can like get these and set them and then we also have like an api too that you can configure it as well so we do have some customers who have i think like ten thousand different roles oh wow so you can really customize it but if right. you actually have that many you're probably configured in sync weird and there's like some other more advanced like regexes that you can do to like really narrow down your roles right so is you get everything... to that point to custom. Okay. Is the is what we've been seeing so far, is this all the open source stuff? Yep. Okay. Um, and then what does if I use this is it the SaaS solution? Is that correct and best way to describe that? Um Yeah, like teleport cloud. Yeah. So is is that just alleviate like what what am I getting? What am I what can I pay for? I guess it's the, maybe you know. Yeah, so the, um, we have Teleport Enterprise, which I think includes cloud now. And that just means you don't have to run like this root cluster. So we mm -hmm. run and maintain Teleport for you. So if you're used to, um, you know, being very SaaS centric, it just makes your like administration sort of a bit easier. There's one less thing to worry about. But often people like Teleport because they can run it themselves within the data center and really limit and sort of fine tune and control it. Right. Right. It sounds a little, um, and okay. So you have the SAS offering essentially. Um, yeah. Are the four, you, you, I think we kind of talked about at the beginning about the, there's different types of teleport or different maybe i'm thinking of the different ways different types of resources i can connect to like protocols but, that you can access yeah so i i like the database stuff was really interesting to me and i was um you may not may or not have a demo for that but i didn't quite understand how a protocol specific connection worked um i think like, i might be able to give you a like in my talk is my if i bring up a sql gui from like mysql and it's is it actually talking the MySQL to the proxy? Is that kind of what's happening there? Yes. Yeah. So let's say, so um, we have these instructions here. So I'm going to log, uh, let's see, PSH, the login, not SQL. Okay. Uh... Login is the role. Oh. I think I just need to move this around. Sometimes it's, you know, like the weird thing with like cloud databases is that they have like very specific. Let's just see. Maybe that's making my history. service account i think i need to fix my um i like i am token so sometimes there's like a little bit of like yak shaving for the intricacies of the different platforms 
uh, but once you sort of configured it, you sort of do it once and then you can um, access it. Talking about GUIs, lots of GUIs do support um, certificates. It's sort of, especially in like the mode of MySQL, like they still call them like SSL certificates. Many of them are not updated to TLS, but you can also support it too. So you can use sort of short-lived certificates for access for um, Postgres and MySQL as well. Yeah, I was going to say, is this... Um... I'm trying to figure out how that connection works because obviously like this is another problem of you know when when we're troubleshooting right uh there's a database let's say it's rds in aws and i got a postgres server in there and it's the production database and we're seeing weird errors and we're worried that it may be something wrong with the sql data and we just need to get someone connected directly to the database to do some selects and figure out if the data is, needs to be you know somehow it got screwed up and that process inevitably, you know, it's like now I'm creating a database user and I'm handing that to a particular person and now they always have it and the passwords never expire. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> that that would be a, a, is that kind of a scenario where this just replaces that whole workflow? Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of a similar vein, like you know databases have the most sensitive information you might have like a range of people from like uh data engineering to just an engineer who wants to run a query um like any kind of like human interaction you should use sort of teleport for it uh, just because you get so much visibility into like what's happening about those, right um, database actions and that's a good distinction to make real quick is it sounds like teleport is a is focused on humans connecting to systems or resources, not resources connecting to resources, right? Yeah, you can configure. So you can use teleport with Jenkins, for example, and it just sort of, it also depends upon your threat model. So, you know, you can't necessarily give Jenkins a 10 hour certificate for access because, you know, it needs a new one in 10 hours. Right. And so in that case, we have people who sort of use our API and they always like reissue Jenkins a new certificate every 10 hours or if you can have people do each run. And so what that means is if, if your CI system was ever compromised and someone got the certificates of the service, they only got access for that short period of time and everything's sort of like refreshed again. Okay. So sort of like it does put, if you start thinking about short lived certificates, you put, you get like a much better like hygiene kind of policy in place. Right. Um, do you happen to have, I'm a, all year long, I've been talking about GitHub Actions. Do you have anything in the works for something with GitHub Actions for that so that we can run an action against, like for example, um, I've got some functional tests that I'm running in GitHub Actions on GitHub Action Public Runners, and they're, uh, they need a remote database, maybe because it's got to actually test RDS and some S3 stuff inside of a VPC. So is there, um, is there anything with that? that you, we didn't you, have anything out of the box, but I think it'd be something fun to explore. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan this year of getting all of my tooling into their own their own actions so that I can uh just basically plug and play a, a workflow together and not have to write a bunch of custom bash and <laughs> you know I'm I'm trying to downplay all the bash scripts that everyone's putting in their CI and say like let's get back to um declarative uh approaches and and try to take our CI to the next level. So we've we've talked a lot about GitHub Actions. So I just thought I'd ask yeah, there. Cool. Um, no, I definitely need to look into more. Yeah, and if, if so you can do it with Jenkins, demo. you can probably do it with GitHub. But yeah, it might be a little different. Let's see um, if this works. Um, yeah. So Sly's asking about like yeah, database GUIs like SSMS, or is this really just command line tooling? Um. So it sounds like the, the, the GUIs have to support certificates? Yeah, if you come to uh, our docs, we have, I think there's actually a page here for uh, under our guides for database GUI clients. And these are the ones that we've tried. So I like PG admin. Okay. And often um, they're like, it's a bit weird, these sort of you, um, these GUIs. So just like kind of read our instructions. You can also reach out to us. We're happy to help. And so like what you do is you load in the key file, which kind of stays the same. And you just do THH login, which um, will refresh them. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, because uh, you know I have to keep remembering that this isn't this isn't some system based VPN that allows anything to run through that tunnel. This is a protocol specific, and it doesn't it doesn't wrap my client tools. It sounds like it, exp- it the, the client tool Correct. is it's dependent upon the client tools functionality, and this is all yeah. using PKI. This is like all certificate based. Yeah. Um, all right, so we've talked about Kubernetes, we've talked about SSH, we've talked about uh, database connections. Um, you want to cover real quick, since we got a few more, a few more minutes, you want to cover like, how, a little bit more of how the, web, the web-based access works? Yeah, I'm actually, I just have this uh, small Docker Compose script, which is, it just has Grafana and Teleport running. Uh, let me... Wait for this to um, so what we have here is we just have a Grafana service and a teleport service running. It's just running. So this a we have to have a small network, like a bridge network between these two. And this is running in node nap mode. I might need to get a new key for this, but let's see if it works. So what you see here, this is like, this host is my local Docker instance, um, which has gone from my sort of computer at home, like back up to teleport. Okay. And if you see here, I have a range of applications. It's doing some initial redirects. Looks like it's alive. And what you see now, this is the Grafana dashboard. But this is the Grafana running on my laptop. And then it's kind of the connections going through Teleport. So even you can like access this. And this is sort of an example of using Teleport for application access. You might want to secure your own Grafana dashboard, or you could use this for um, if you had some staging or a local dev environment you wanted to share with the rest of your teammates, you could use Teleport application access to, um, you know, share it and get sort of early feedback. I'm trying to think about how that works. Okay, so I've so you've got that running on your local system. You're like you're, you're maybe you're you're creating some custom Grafana dashboard. How do I get access to it? Like, how does that actually? How does that connection actually work? Yeah, so you, I've given you access already, so you should be able to access it. Um, if you go to this URL, or if you go to the, um, so let's say if you have like a team of people, I can be like, right, can you just go to um, applications page, find like the local Docker instance, click launch, or you can go to this URL. And so how is it, it just, works is it, on the, oh, sorry, go ahead. How it works is, you can think of it like an SSH reverse tunnel. And so the initial connection goes through teleport, and then it sort of like proxies your connection and sort of down to my machine where I have this sort of teleport running a sort of a sidecar. And that sort of puts that connection okay. back into the teleport root cluster and you sort of access it through the root cluster. It sounds a little bit like inlets, if you've ever heard of Alex Ellis's inlets proxy. Um, We've talked about it on the show before. We've had him on the show. Um, so, so you, yeah. So basically, your machine is reaching out to your teleport server, making that making that permanent connection that all this protocol is t- uh, tunneling through, and then I am typing in the URL of essentially of the proxy server, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, like to me, it looks like you just have like an internet uh, TLS proxy with a friendly name that happens to then redirect it to your machine. So, okay. Yeah. And it like Grafana for me, I can probably access it on this. Uh, I don't know if I can access it on this. I can probably need to access on zero, zero. This is how I could like access it through kind of like Docker networking. Right. Directly on your machine without teleport. Okay. Yeah. Without teleport. But I obviously can't share this like zero, zero, zero with you. Sure. Right. <laughs> so. so yeah. So I like that sidecar an- analogy. So, okay. So then would you need one of these teleport sidecars for each web app that you wanted to have distinctly in that list? 
Uh, not necessarily. You can add multiple ones, but it's probably a good security model to have one sidecar. They're very small, like right. instances. Otherwise, you, you can can't. Do... Oh, sorry. Yeah, then you just have like the local loop back, so you don't have to like yeah. put the application too wide on the network. Yeah. Otherwise, I would imagine like you can't granularly control each individual one. It's it's all or nothing if you're putting a bunch in there. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So this is almost like an, I like this. It's like an application list of of things I can access that. I may not have direct connectivity, may or may not have direct connectivity to those things, but this uh, almost becomes like the, uh, this is a, it's a totally different technology, but this kind of reminds me of if anyone's ever had to run like a Citrix server, uh, you would get a web page with all these app buttons and they, could, they would be running all over the place. You have no idea where those apps are actually running and what data center or whatever, but you, the user, just sees a web page, you click it, the thing opens and it it's kind of magic. I mean, that's a totally different technology, but uh, you didn't, you know, it didn't matter what, uh, it didn't matter what system I was on or where, what, where I was on the network, I could just get to those things. So that's a pretty interesting um, workflow there. So are all, is that, yeah. so when it's listing applications, is that including Kubernetes? Cube control, or no, is that really just web web applications? These are web dashboards. Okay. I have added the you know like the standard Kubernetes dashboard before. Oh and right, so right, right. Oh, that, I see on the left. Like... I'm just now realizing on the left, I can see applications, Kubernetes databases. So they're individually called out, right? Okay. Yeah. And then servers at the top. Okay. Yeah. So like the Kubernetes dashboard because it's what it's HTTP. Um, yeah, very neat. And again, this is all this is this is all open source right now. We're all looking yep, at the everything's been open source. Um, I know we're coming near the end, but the last one I was going to show you. So this one, I think we can like show the pair pairing on an SSH host. But this is sort of a hack. We currently we do have a ticket open for sort of pairing on Kubernetes sessions, but you can then log in again on inside of a teleport session oh right so you just you get that node access that you can share through the browser and then you can do whatever you want like cube control yeah. okay so you're you're teleporting inside your teleport correct but what i do here is i have a local user uh, So if I log in as this local user, which I need to get my phone for. So many passwords. And then I will to download kubeconfig to so this host, and then we can like pair on a um, Kubernetes session at one time. Right. Very cool. Or I could just use VS Code. <laughs> and we could oh, pair yeah. on VS Code with... Um... The uh, question from the audience, Mohammed asks, uh, for tunneling, does it use something like WireGuard under the hood? We don't use WireGuard currently. I actually have a really good blog post on using WireGuard for Kubernetes. Uh, and we actually have an open source project. Um, but I can send afterwards. I forget is WireGuard protocol specific, or is it more of a universal tunnel? I always understood it as a universal. I think it's universal tunnel. Yeah. Um, here we had this one for 2019. So that if you're interested in, in like WireGuard and using WireGuard for Kubernetes, Kevin wrote this blog post, um, which we used for Gravity, but I think it's an open source project you can use. So if you ever want to go deep on WireGuard for Kubernetes, I'd highly check, um, recommend checking out this post. Let's see if I can find that. Wire. And it sort of covers sort of everything and kind of goes a deep into it. Yeah. yeah, wormhole, yeah. Okay. I'll put that in chat for Muhammad if they are interested. Um, interesting. Uh, any uh, other... Also... Oh, sorry, go ahead. There is this like other cool feature. So this one has a, like um, eBPF um, kernel module. So this is our new sort of restricted sessions. And uh, what's cool about this is, you know, it's kind of like standard host, you can run various commands, but under the hood, we hook into a range of 
um, sort of like an EPF module. So we get like very deep information about the session commands or like network requests that are made. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, which is like way more in depth. So if you ever want to go like super deep into like what's happening or this is actually surprising all these like other programs that run when you run like HTOP. Right. So and is that I, on by default? Is it, is it just natively using eBPF all the time or? Yeah, you need to turn it on as um, a feature, but it also, we changed it with Teleport 7 that you need a relatively new um, distro, so at least 2010 um, Ubuntu, so it has to be above 5.8 Linux kernel. Oh, okay. So if you're super interested in um, like network requests or commands, it's sort of a cool feature to check out. Also, we're not yeah. open source edition. Very cool. Um, and for those that don't know what eBPF is, um, Berkeley packet filter, is that right? Yeah. It started as Berkeley packet filter. And I think of it as just a, it made writing programs at the kernel level much easier and they don't sort of crash and destroy the system. Destroy and, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was popularized a lot from monitoring. Um, I know Brendan Gregg at Netflix has a bunch of great talks on it. Yeah. Um, but there's That's also how I learned about it actually. Security. Um, all right. Uh, anything else you want to show off before we uh, wrap this up? No, I, I think we've covered a lot today. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, anyone else from the chat? I'm going to give you another minute uh, to ask your last minute questions on teleport. Um, okay. Yeah. So how do they get it? Um, get yeah, you just go to get started. Just come to the free download. I mean, you can download it here. I'd recommend checking out this quick start guide. Uh, I have a short, like five minute video on setting it up. Um, if you have seven, if there's 77 people on the phone on the line right now, you can like get us to 10,000 stars. <laughs> All right. I'll put my star in. So we're, we're a, a gravitational GitHub gravitational teleport, right? Let me, uh, yeah. yeah. Gravitational. In fact, gravitational on, teleport. on the website on, on github.com, it, it actually just shows 9.9 K. So I will put everyone to that um, that GitHub. We'll see if we can't get you a little bit closer. A little bit closer. It's a fantasy metric, but you know. Well, yeah, I mean, but it's fun. We all love round numbers. Like, uh, you yeah. know, I've been I've been watching my Twitter feed for the longest time, waiting for it to hit ten thousand, and it's been really slow going. But I'm I'm excited that it might happen one day, maybe this year. Uh, who knows? Um, but yeah, so the so we can go to the website, download it, walk through the examples, or you can read all about it on the table of contents on GitHub if that's your preference. Uh, I tell you what, I I spend so much of my life on GitHub now, I might as well just have a GitHub computer. Like all my tabs are all GitHub, and so I I almost always prefer the GitHub format over uh, over website formats for. Yeah, actually, if you want to get started, I mean, this is super concise. Read me. You don't have to go to our website. Um, right. Everything you need is here. And then also, if you're interested in hacking and Go, it's like a super clean Go project as well. Also hiring. So um, oh, there you go. If you want to hack those... on some open source Go, come join. Yeah, the ship. if you if you if you're uh, I, I about every month I hear I I work with a lot of projects obviously and I have a lot of students and all the all the time I see people switching to GoLang and um, it's so much to the point now that I feel I feel like that even if I don't develop it in it every day I just need to know it. Now, like it, like it's become one of those things like Python or Bash or uh, that you just or JavaScript. That it's, it's almost like at some point you're going to be expected to know. If you're in the cloud native space, you probably need to at least know how to read GoLang. <laughs> so um, it's awesome that you guys have such open source. Jason, thank you for the open source community version, and I think that's going to wrap it up. Well, thanks, thanks so much for being on the show. We've been planning this now for about a month, I think, and. Yeah. Uh, it's been great to get some demos. I have been very curious about this product and wanting to use it on my own stuff, especially the, uh, not realizing how much of it is open source. Um, it's It seems very interesting to me to be able to have universal, because I, I have all the same needs, just on a personal level. I have Kubernetes clusters that I use. I have nodes that I want to get into, and I have websites running in places that I don't, like the Kubernetes dashboard, that I don't necessarily want to have just complete open public access. And the only thing that's blocking me is the, the Kubernetes certificate that's only on my machine because I haven't put it anywhere else or backed it up. So um, this might be a good thing to check out. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, Ben. You can see, by the way, you can get a hold of him on Twitter. I'm just going to volunteer him. If you have any further questions, get him on Twitter. And uh, oh, we've I got a Slack to... channel too. If you want to join us in uh, 
think you just can't. Oh, no. Oh, let me go back to uh, teleport Slack channel. It's oh, nice. Open, so yeah. So you have you more questions, and I'm sure there's people Slack. in there to, to help. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for being on the show. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you all next week here on YouTube Live. Uh, I, we're, we did have a guest next week, but we are uh, discussing moving that. So if you get on my Patreon, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, links down below, links up above. If you get on that uh, Patreon email, then you will know what's going to happen next week. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. Ciao.